Is that Siri? I know. <laughs> um, good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Pretty fantastic. Um, this is a really great group of people. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk with all of you. Um, thank you for coming in early. I guess me and Nabil, the rest of you are like, hurry up, wake up. What are you doing? But uh, uh, my name, so I guess we'll do a, some introductions. Yeah. Um, my name is Jen Apodaca. I'm the chair of the Coffee Roasters Guild. And the Coffee Roasters Guild, since, um, since sort of shelter in place we started and we had this global pandemic start, has um, been doing an online series called Still Roasting. And the Still Roasting series has been uh, a global effort. The first one that we did was in Taiwan with one of our leadership council members, Lulu. And Lulu interviewed um, coffee roasting professionals and, that, and talked about their experience and how they were handling the pandemic and how it affects their businesses. And we wanted to take this conversation to different regions all around the world. So we've been to Taiwan and we've been to Europe. And uh, most recently, there was one led by Erica that um, on the Leadership Council for Mexicanos, which um, one of our panelists joined on that one, Arely. Um, and now this one here is specifically focused on coffee roasters in the United States. And because we are focusing on coffee roasters in the United States, um, I've invited my friend, Beth Beal, who is um, on the, the um, U.S. chapter for um, SEA U.S. chapter. And so she is going to be co-hosting with me. Um, Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? And then we can introduce our panelists. Yeah, for sure. My name is Beth Beal. I am, as um, Jen said, I'm on the U.S. chapter of the SCA, and I represent the South Central region. I also sit on the competition committee for the U.S., um, and I have a roastery in Austin, Texas, and in Whitefish, Montana. Great. Okay. Well, Let's introduce our panelists here, right? Um, uh, let's start with Lem Butler of Black and White Roasters. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Lem Butler. I'm one of the owners of Black and White Coffee Roasters. Uh, we're fairly new. We started in 2017. Um, I am also the 2016 United States Priest Champion. Um, I've been competing for a while. I started in coffee 17 years ago um, in a uh, a small ca cafe on the campus of UNC at Chapel Hill, and I was there for four years. And that's when I really discovered my love for the coffee industry and wanted to be more a part of it. So I started working for uh, one of the local coffee roasters as a uh, production assistant, bagging coffee. Uh, did that for a couple of years and then moved on to wholesale customer support, supporting a lot of the local and regional accounts, wholesale accounts um, in the area and doing a lot of education. Um, continued to compete the entire time um, and the whole time working uh, in a cafe and working as uh, a customer support rep, I've kind of form formulated this idea of a coffee company and teamed up with a buddy of mine, Kyle Ramage, uh, after he won the 2017 United States Priestess Championship, and we started uh, Black and White Coffee Roasters. And, um, that's, that's how things have, have been. Very cool. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Gabriel Biscana, how did, <laughs> welcome of Machina Roasters. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Gabriel Boscana. I'm the founder and owner of Machina Coffee Roasters. We're outside of Philadelphia, a city called Coatesville, uh, PA. It's like 15 minutes from my house. Um, I've been in coffee a long time. Um, I think this might be year either 18 or 19 total. Started at Gimme Coffee in Ithaca, New York a long time ago. Right? 
and just kind of got stuck as soon as I as soon as I knew um, that I could work with people both in the service industry and coffee producers I was pretty much that was it um, so yeah I'm excited to be here thanks for me to do this absolutely Aureli you want to introduce yourself little waves coffee yeah um, buenos dias everyone my name is Aureli Barrera Kratsky um, I have been in coffee since 2009 um, I think for me the love of coffee started from just seeing how a community space uh, can really transform the community. Um, I am originally from Mexico. I was born in Tijuana and we moved to the States when I was six. Um, first San Antonio and then North Carolina. Um, and I grew up in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, so, you know, I feel like my life has kind of been around uh, brown and indigenous people for most of my upbringing. Um, and so my first culture shock was when I went to UNC Chapel Hill. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I felt like when I, you know, graduated in 2009 from UNC Chapel Hill, I got to go back home and uh, my partner um, now uh, at the time was just an acquaintance and friend, had a coffee shop there with his partner at the time. and. Um, having grown up in Cherokee and seeing um, just being a part of the community, um, it really impacted me how the space uh, was providing uh, for the community in a way that I just felt was very transformative. Um, and so my love for coffee started there um, and the craft, you know, was an extra bonus. Um, so yeah, my husband and I got married in 2010 and that's when Cocoa Cinnamon got started. Um, in my mom's kitchen and with very little money, like literally $75 in her bank account and no access to credit. Um, we just like, we put little waves out into the world of, you know, we were gonna make this happen and we started on a bike, which is actually where my computer is propped up right now. Um, so we moved to Durham, North Carolina. We moved from uh, Western Carolina to Durham, North Carolina to start our business. Um, and why Durham? Uh, we have a great friend uh, who wrote us this beautiful email that was basically like, come to Durham, uh, check us out. And uh, yeah, we like fell in love with it. And just, there's just a lot of, uh, there's this beautiful, like gritty entrepreneurship spirit that exists in Durham and has been here for generations. And there used to be like this flourishing, uh, Black Wall Street here. So I, I don't know, there's just something really beautiful about Durham that drew us here. Um, and from a bike to a Kickstarter to our first location, we now have three cafes and uh, Little Waste Coffee Roasters behind me. Um, and yeah, we started roasting in 2017, um, right around the time that Black and White got started as well. Um, so that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, I'm, uh, my husband and I are the owners, so he kind of handles the cafes and I handle the grocery. Um, and it's been really fun to be in that position to create opportunities for our team, specifically um, women of color and um, our head roaster, Mandy, you know, is uh, uh, non-binary. And it's just been really great to, to see that unfold organically. And just, I think that it speaks volumes to representation and how you build a, a space and, and who's in it. Um, but yeah, that's me. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Nabil. Morning, everyone. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be here on the panel to everybody. Um, very inspiring stories I just heard, so I'm very humbled to come behind uh, all you guys. Um, so my name is Nabil. Um, I founded Grand Coffee in um, actually July 1st, 2010 was our first day of business. So we just are celebrating our 10 year anniversary. Uh, we're just a small cafe um, you know, inside the old concession stands of a movie theater on Mission Street called the Grand Theater. That's where we get our um, our name from. No, no, uh, 
no visions of grandeur for us. <laughs> it just happens to be a big marquee on the building. Um, about two and a half years ago, we uh, we started roasting our own coffee at uh, the Pulley Collective, and that's kind of when we took over the, the means of production instead of being like a a, a wholesale account. And um, we're just on this journey. See where it goes. That's, so um, I apologize. There is like street cleaners. I have no idea if you guys can hear how loud it is. Is it pretty loud? Can you hear no. it? Oh, fantastic. Just me. Um, so uh, thank you all for taking time out on a Friday to come and, um, and have this conversation with us. Um, really appreciate it. So one of the things that I wanted to ask um, is really just kind of start with like uh, 2020 and the pandemic itself. And, you know, like there was, you know, like with the shelter in place ordinances and people getting sick and, you know, um, concerns about health and safety, like public health and safety and your employees, um, as well as financial security, like how to make it through. Um, I would love to ask all of you um, what challenges you were met with and what solutions you found to deal with it. And maybe we'll go in a different order each time we do a question, I guess. So um, maybe this time we'll start with Pirelli. Um, okay. Well, let's see, the pandemic definitely threw a square loop. <laughs> Um, I feel like in March 10 is when it kind of hit us here in, in our area. Um, I am really fortunate to have a partner in this business. Um, Leon comes from a make it happen background. Um, he uh, worked in the film industry for a little bit in New York and just kind of learned the skill of like how to make things out of nothing. Um, and so, you know, I, I call it both a blessing and a curse because it can consume him a little bit too much sometimes. Uh, but that energy was like very present when this happened. And so we were able to just kind of get together and come up with solutions. And um, the thing that I love to laugh about is that we created this like plan that we thought was going to last us for like a month, you know, and it lasted us four days. Um, because of just how quickly everything is changing. Um, and so, you know, I think the biggest thing that for us was important was to have our team in on the conversation and to figure out together, like, how do we manage and tackle this? Um, you know, when we were creating these plans, it was this in our, in our minds and what the government was telling us is that this is gonna be an eight week thing. Mm -hmm. And so we started thinking like, okay, how do we survive for eight weeks if we need to completely close down? Um, because that's another thing is that like, you know, we've been building out since 2015 um, or 2013 really. And so like any revenue that comes in has just been invested back into the business. And so when this hit us, it's not like we had this like pot of money that we could like rely on. Um, and so yeah, we were like just crunching the numbers and trying to figure out like, what does it look like? And what does it also look like if we don't have to close down, but sales go down? Um, so eventually like we put this plan together, we put it out to the team, we had conversations about people's safety and like, you know, immediately realized we needed to just like completely close the shops. Like I think the first week we were still kind of new to it and people were still entering into the space. Uh, but everyone was scared, and then eventually we just decided to make that decision of like, we're going to have to shift over to just online and pick up. Um, and during this time as a roastery, like we have been focusing heavily on wholesale. And, you know, our online sales like weren't necessarily a stream of revenue because we were just so new to um, online sales. And um, as soon as this hit, we realized that we needed to sell at least 230 bags if we weren't going to be relying on sales of the cafe to get through and um, you know having 
had our conversations with our team. We have about 40 plus people working with us. Um, and so, you know, some people decided that they could do without working. And so they opted to not come to work. Um, have Some of them have been doing unemployment and everyone else who felt like they needed to work. Um, we created everything in our, like, that we could as possible to like keep the spaces as like only employees, like, and, you know, creating just like protocols and making sure that whatever we're doing outside of work is being mindful of the rest of the team. Um, and also having like the option out there that if anyone does get sick or if anyone is feeling uncomfortable but can't afford to come in to have that conversation with us because we're, we are still a small business and, you know, for us, it's important to just have open communication stuff because at the end of the day like we do care about all of our employees and their safety and um yeah just like open communication was the main thing um but yeah so then we decided 230 bags of coffee sales of um of retail bags is what was going to get us through so we put that action out into the world and um you know for the month of march i felt like our sales online just like skyrocketed um, our production in the roastery changed drastically and you know we had a few days where we were completely new to it and I was staying in here until 1 a.m like figuring out how to get the next day ready you know um, which was you know a blessing and that we were just able to survive and every single payroll that we've made has been a celebration um but yeah now we're in this like what 16 weeks in now um and you know we're starting to see like this curves of of sales online and you know we started doing subscriptions which is something that we didn't have already implemented and that's been huge and, and now it's just yeah now it's just trying to figure out like how to get back to a, a so that we can start looking at, um, yeah, where to go from there in terms of wholesale and, um, you know, some of the cafe business has popped back up, which has been great. So it's not heavily relying on the industry. Uh, but yeah, every day it's just, you know, scheming and planning how to think about the future because we don't see this as being obviously eight weeks, uh, two weeks is like a, Three to five year process that we're going to be encountering, uh, and maybe even longer than that. Are your cafes still closed, like for customers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the, the city has like you know opened it back up, but we're just too afraid to even let people sit outside, honestly. Um, because if we open the outside, like um, bathrooms, you know, are needed. And um, it's just scary to, especially when the numbers haven't gone down, you know, it's not like it's any safer than it was when it's all first started. Um, so for us, like we plan on staying, um, yeah, keeping the cafes closed to the public, but still continuing to do um, opens, like, to online pickup contactless. Um, I don't know if you can see in the background, it might be it might be a little hard to see, but um, we basically, all of our shops have garage doors. Um, so we're able to open a garage door. And right now, because it's so hot outside, um, we, put, we implemented like a little tent that we can like then plastic around the garage door so that we can keep it as cool as possible in here. Um, and you know, thinking about the winter, uh, we'll, we'll probably end up bringing that tent in and allowing people to enter into that tent only, um, and just trying to keep up with like, you know, innovating ways to stay open and keep it safe for both our team and the community. Um, uh, North Carolina implemented a uh, mandate that everyone needs to be wearing a mask when they go out so that's been a huge help for our business i think um, that it's actually a mandate and that we're not the only ones being like we need to the, you know, help protect our team and does someone stand out in the tent all day or do you do they call in 
Yeah, so Square lets you, or any really, like, there's a lot of apps out there that um, you can do to, like, place the order online. People can walk up and we can place their order for them. Um, it just takes a little bit longer. And so it's, we, rec we highly recommend people to order, like, ahead of time and then they get a, a, a text or an email saying your order is ready and then they come and they, we have it ready at a table outside. Um, and so there's at least, like, a good eight feet between the customer and our team member um, and yeah so I'm I'm at the Lakewood location which is our third location where we sell Trubos as well um, and it's got the longest walk so we we're getting in our exercise too <laughs> See. Um, Nabil, you also had the cafe open as well. What was your, what's your experience and your interaction with your customers and what would you be working on? Um, so, the, so Grand is a really small space. It's, um, it's uh, about 250 square feet. Um, so you walk inside, there's, we have like, a, we have a bar with four stores and, and then there's the counter people order from. Yeah, but we're also along the Mission Street in San Francisco, and the Mission, like especially Mission Street, is kind of like San Francisco's second downtown. It's very vibrant. It's a Latino neighborhood. There's tons of people walking around. We've got uh, two major bus lines going up and down Mission Street, so there's a lot of foot traffic. There's a lot happening. Um, and before there was actually like the the, the stay 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 in place um, order was issued by the governor. Or, or by the by the Bay Area counties, uh, we already kind of like just following the whole news story, like on, on internationally. I kind of already saw where things were going, and and saw what what was implemented in in, um, in like China and Korea and Japan before things were implemented here. So we already had started to set certain protocols in place. And for instance, we um, we pulled all this cream and sugar and lids behind the counter, and customers weren't touching those things anymore. And then we started disinfecting all, all the surfaces inside the shop, uh, like every like it was like every like ten minutes. And it, and I had to work with the staff to kind of, you know, like you know kind of like this is serious. This is not a joke. Like like ignore other stories that you hear. This is what the science says. And uh, you know and and got the hand washing implemented, the disinfecting implemented. And then once the the actual like. Um, stay in place was issued with the exception of essential businesses um, being allowed to open, which we were, luckily we were one of those. Uh, it was, we did a quick pivot and what we did was we, since we are along this major thoroughfare, uh, we happen to have a window along Mission Street. Um, so we, all we had to do is just close the door or there's a gate in front of the door. We shut the gate and open the window and we're able to serve our customers through a window one at a time. Uh, so it was, we, we basically, we never had to close the cafe uh, during, during this thing, during the situation, but the whole nature of the business changed. Like, um, like what Ariely said, we went from, first of all, we lost, we're in a neighborhood. Okay. First of all, let me start to go backwards. So the neighborhood we in has um, a lot of people work in the neighborhood and a lot of people live in the neighborhood. So the nature of the business was we'd catch people coming into the our, the neighborhood who are working and we'd catch people leaving the neighborhood who are commuting out to go to work. So we lost basically half of those customers, which are the ones that were coming into the neighborhood to work because everyone was, was working from home. So what we had to do with the, to make up that difference was, um, again, was uh, bean sales. So we, we basically started, um, really focusing on selling bags of coffee to our customers who are going to like come maybe once a week, stock up on their coffee and then stay at home and work. And that's been kind of like the saving grace to the business. Um, also from a production standpoint, um, uh, we were lucky to, to work with the folks at Pulley who uh, we basically changed up like how our roast schedule, we used to roast every week and we basically talked to them and said, Hey, the pars are down, so how about we roast every other week, and we get a break on uh, the rent that we're paying, 
in order to like keep cost and control. And um, luckily, the, that was something that they worked with us on, and we were able to do that. So that helps us keep our costs down and save money, and and really run lean in in a way where we didn't have to like lay off anybody, um, and just maintain the staff. And everybody was working. And uh, the, another thing is just we just happen to be lucky that we're not you know a lot of the um, the medium sized roasters like the, the right that consider ourselves very small roastery. But a lot of the medium-sized roasters in San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area, they were doing a lot of wholesaling. Like a big chunk of their wholesale was going to like a lot of the um, like corporate campuses, whether it's like the Googles, the Facebooks, and the Apples. So their their production was geared towards providing coffee to like these offices, and we were really small, so we didn't have that. So we didn't experience like a big loss in. Um, in revenue like our, our right now like our revenue streams are very like very much like even between like cafe business we had our wholesale business with the restaurants which obviously we lost that but then the, the retail bag business both online and walk up to the store um, made up for the lost wholesale so we were pretty fortunate to be like a small roastery that that could kind of like pivot fast and also um, uh, not be exposed to to losing like big wholesale accounts. So I guess we we're just fortunate to not be that big of a roaster. <laughs> and uh, Nabil, when you made these changes, like how hard was it to like get your customers to like adapt to the changes? Was it was it easy or I mean, are you still working on that? Yeah, so it was it was tough because like at the very beginning, like people are very everyone was on edge, and we had to you know we're people are they're on the sidewalk, they're outside, so it's not like there's no parking lot where you walk up to the cafe. We're literally we're on the street, so the problem to get people to be like, hey, don't lean in the window, don't, don't like, grab stuff or don't touch stuff. So we had to kind of like work with people and and do that, and and you know us the staff we were kind of like nervous. And then other people were nervous. So a lot of times there was a couple confrontations where people were like, hey man, like you're treating me like I'm some sort of like diseased person or something like that. So it's like, you know, we just had to be like, hey, it's not, it's not, you know, it's it's for public safety. It's not about us saying that we think, you know, you have coronavirus or whatever. It's just we just need to assume that, you know, we all have it. And let's just kind of like start from there. And that's the best way we could practice uh uh good public health. Um but with that said, we had this other challenge where we didn't want to go fully contactless with payments because the neighborhood we're in, it's it's predominantly Latino neighborhood and, and a lot of our customers pay with cash. So if we were to say no cash, then we're going to be excluding a lot of our customers. So we do have to take cash um, in order to, to be more inclusive. So we so basically it's like a lot of hand washing. You know, we have like the money plate set up so there's no hand-to-hand -hand exchanges but you know and also um because we are a small cafe um in our production area for uh basically you have one barista in there at a time you know so and 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 what we did with that was like you know it's like it doesn't matter how long the line gets like people have nowhere to go like this is the funnest thing they're going to do all day is stand in line and get a cup of coffee so don't worry about working fast don't worry about like don't get nervous if like you see like 10 people in line just just go one at a time work slow work safe work clean and um and it, it's like basically like if somebody because we we could do like three transactions in a row that are contactless and all you're doing is like making the cup of coffee and, and giving it to them but if you get like one or two like uh or three cash transactions in a row then you have to like stop and wash your hands between each uh, of those transactions so then we figured out well don't take the order then touch the money and then make the drink because then you're gonna have to like you'll have an extra hand washing step so we you know as we, we do this more and more we start to get more a little bit of experience and be like okay take you know take the order make the order and then do the the, the, the money transaction at the very end and then wash your hands and then you get the next customer so you know we're just little things that we're, we're learning how to do um to to minimize um well i don't want to say to minimize hand washing but you know what i'm saying <laughs> to to minimize like redundant hand washings uh because that's been a big problem with like 
like just like working like uh in um in the cafe i mean it's like dry hands is a thing <laughs> you know dry like especially with like if you're using a uh, uh, hand sanitizer with the alcohol and all the detergents the soaps and you're washing you know your hands are getting wet a lot and also with the uh the sandy liquid having to wipe everything down so it's been um you know it's been challenging but the staff's done a really good job and, and also another thing i want to mention was here in san francisco uh for all essential workers they have free like COVID testing so we're all on the schedule like every like seven to ten days we all go get tested and we're able to like continually do that and and the best thing about that is saying oh wow like all the protocols that we put in place they're working because no, no one's um, show, none of our tests showed up positive. We continue to test negative, so that's like it's like getting really good positive feedback because you, you know as we see numbers go up in other places and other counties around us, we can see that all the steps that we're taking to work safely are actually working because we're we're going and get tested, and um, and the tests come up negative. So that's it's very helpful to, to the fact that the county provides that to essential workers here in San Francisco. Yeah, that's awesome. I think I totally about the hand washing. I think for like the first two weeks afterwards, like I turned into like a lizard, like a molting lizard. There was my hands got all scaly, and I was like, oh, I need to drink more water or hydrate or something. I bought this giant thing of lotion. Yeah, and I had to change my entire system, my my self care skin system, basically. But I hear that. Um, Lem, you also have, you guys have like three cafes and you're also in the same um, like region as Arelli. Did you have a lot of the same experiences or did you have different experiences with your cafes and your business? Yeah, uh, we, we were concerned about um, the staff mainly. Um, fear was the other concern of ours. Uh, we, we, we asked our staff if they, if they felt comfortable working, um, they could work. And we wanted to provide that opportunity. We didn't want to fire anyone or, or close the cafes if we didn't have to. Um, our, our original cafe is in Wake Forest, and Wake Forest is a, a, a really small community. And I mean, that's that's one of our core values, community. So we wanted to make sure um, we were able to staff that and provide this respite for um, for for that community and and just people to get away from the fear and to see that we are open. We're not, um, we're cautious, but we're not fearful of the situation. Because uh, I mean, I felt like fear is one of the poisonous things that just kind of spreads easily and just make horrible decisions out of fear. So uh, the staff was really game on, on working. Um, only one, one team member didn't feel safe, so she stayed home. Um, Roseville was our newest newest location and the only place that we do food in-house um, and that one stayed open as well uh, the staff was wanted to work so we, we let them work uh, but the uh, the location downtown is inside of uh, Vidiria chocolate factory and downtown area pretty much shut down and everyone who worked downtown just worked from home so um, we had to get creative with that spot uh, we weren't really concerned about, um, you know, making money at that location. Just wanted to make sure it was still open. The dairy, they actually closed in the beginning, uh, but we kept our, our uh, cafe open. We just put a door, a, a table by the door and um, put up a, a nice plexiglass glass shield and had our staff wear masks. Uh, we only operated with one person there and having a roastery is great because we were able to rotate our staff into the to the roastery. Um, wholesale fell off tremendously, just like Vidari. Vidari, uh, we were operating at like an 80 to 90 percent loss in that cafe, uh, but just to have it open, um, just to provide that, you know, that respite for people that if they do want to come down, um, they can. And we, we established a uh, an online curbside pickup menu specifically for this situation. Um, and with wholesale falling off tremendously, uh, online retail has been incredible. It, it, it rose like 300%. Uh, we ran out of our custom bags because we did not anticipate that at all. Uh, thank you, Aureli, for uh, giving us some bags, <laughs> get us through some time. I mean, even the temporary bags that we ordered, we ran out of. <laughs> we had to 
Carl O'Reilly, and uh, they've been awesome in helping us. Uh, I mean, even from the beginning. Um, so that was that was really cool to see um, online retail just rocket like through the roof. And me having some underlying uh, health conditions, I was able to stay home. And having a business partner uh, who's super gung ho about every single thing that he does, he was able to be in the roastery, uh, visit the cafes, and, and meet with our managers. Uh, and I just made like awesome like home videos of how to brew coffee and just trying to promote what we were doing uh, online and in the cafes. Um, and now, I mean, we're starting to see, we didn't allow people inside the cafe. Like each cafe, we had a table and a blast shield right by the door so people could come up, order the coffee. Uh, it was all contactless. We didn't take any cash. And, and this is all like just meeting with the staff and figuring out what they wanted to do to make them feel safe because um, we wanted them to come to work if they wanted to. And it, and it worked out great. Uh, Wake Forest is, a, an incredible community of people who value their local cafe. And the turnout was just incredible. Uh, and as people were forced to stay home more and more, they wanted to get out. So uh, we added some really cool specials to uh, you know, get people drinking more coffee. So if you bought a bag of coffee, you get a free drip. Or if you bought food in Roseville, you get uh, free coffee with your food. And uh, we brought back our, our free shipping online um, to support people buying coffee for, for home. Um, and it, it's been great. And thank goodness, you know, our governor has some sort of a mental capacity to be like, hey, we need to flatten this curve out and uh, make everyone wear masks. So um, we have on our, our front doors, if you don't have a mask, you, you can't. Uh, order order anything. Um, two of the cafes were allowing people inside to to order. Uh, we have our uh, panda stickers on the floor, six feet apart. Uh, so and, and you have to have a mask to come in. We also have the blast shield up by the register. Um, at the downtown location at Bedary, we have this beautiful patio right beside the building, and uh, we're going to, we're building a a, a, a counter on that patio so and we added a gate so people can actually walk to the patio and if they want to sit outside they can sit outside we have our table six feet apart um, and just makes it easier for us and for uh, the chocolate factory to do their thing they've also in, added a awesome i can't wait for this to open up but a uh, side window uh, to order chocolate soft serve ice cream so I'm really stoked about that. Uh, we'll do some collaborations with coffee and ice cream as well. Um, and so, so the community has embraced us because we have been open and they're continue, continuing to come out and, and represent. Uh, and we're seeing the downtown numbers creep back up to where uh, they were before the pandemic. And um, yeah, so, I, and again, now with, uh, with these uh, cases surging again, um, we have systems in place. So if there is another shutdown and we are still deemed as essential, uh, we can navigate through that uh, with success. Um, so uh, it, it's been, th there's a silver lining in everything, I think. Uh, I think we'll talk about that when we get to the third question, but um, it, it's been good so far. That's awesome. I think, you know, like I, so I work at Pulley and we have a lot of Nabil roasts with, uh, at my warehouse where I'm at right now. And, uh, a lot of our customers that, uh, roast here, those that have stayed open have noticed that the community really does embrace and support them and is really thankful that they're open. Um, and I think that that just goes to show how important like our businesses are, you know, um, Gabe, you are like Beth and I, where, like, Beth, you don't have a cafe. You have a training center and you do roasting. Is that right? But, um, no, we have, we have cafes in Montana. You have cafes Full in Montana? Montana. Restaurants. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Geez. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, Gabe, you're wholesale, right? Like, yeah. and 
in transitioning too. <laughs> yeah, so, I picked an awesome, awesome kind of start. <laughs> my my lease, you know, I chose. Um, we'll get into this later, but I I chose Coatesville is, a, is the only incorporated city in the county of Chester out here in PA. It's for like boroughs and stuff and townships. Um, I chose Coatesville because it's actually mostly black and brown people. Um, I think I I want to say that it's thirty percent uh, white, and the rest is basically black and brown, which is a big reason why I chose that that space because I wanted to really open up something that served a community that desperately needed a place. Um, so so f I, I chose the worst, I guess the pandemic was the right time for me and I chose the wrong time um, because my lease basically started in March. So as soon as I'm like, cool, I'm gonna get in and start working this pandemic hit. And so I, I basically couldn't do anything to build out for a couple months. Um, and um, I have a divorced dad and uh, I have my daughter most of the time. And so school's closed at the same time. So I was literally having to figure, and I, I'm also, a, I work for Bellwether Coffee. So I had working from home, trying to somehow build a, a business, like build out a roastery, homeschool my child and, and not be able to leave my house. I had to somehow do all of those things. Um, I don't think I've been that tired since she was born. <laughs> I was like constant. Uh, so Machina has mostly been wholesale and subscription and, and retail. Um, so the plan was to open a cafe, a really small area of the roasting space was to do like a little cafe and, and that, that's been next for now. Uh, not forever, but um, it, it's not something I feel comfortable doing um, right now because I, I think that in that space, in that community, I, I doing a cafe right now um i don't think would bring what i want what i want to bring to the community yet um but in regards to how how have i shaped the business so that we're able to stay afloat uh right while i build out the space um my friend aunt and my friend rita have been roasting out of illinois and fulfilling the orders uh which has been amazing because the business has been able to still bring in revenue um while i make decisions over here um, I would say the thing that that I could do and that I did do was offer free shipping no matter what to any wholesale partners that were able to stay open. Uh, that is a huge hit because shipping is really expensive. Um, so anywhere from like three pounds to like 90 pounds if you order it, I'm gonna, you know, till the end of the year, I'm, I'm offering free shipping um, because I, I want every anyone that, that we work with, I, I want to be able to support as much as I can, even if it's a sacrifice, because I feel like in the end, when we do that for one another in a consistent basis, everyone does win. I'm not looking to get rich. I'm not looking to dominate anything. I just, I, I want to do as much as I can. Um, so it's like a circular thing. Uh, so we did that and that was great. We did see a spike in retail web orders, a big spike. Um, people working from home, they want coffee. Um, that was awesome. A couple of wholesale accounts stayed open and they, they kept ordering, which is awesome. So I, I didn't think I would make it through this way as I as, as we have, which I'm grateful for. Um, but thinking about you know how you build a roastery to accommodate um, production, <laughs> you know, six feet apart, constantly wiping things down, it makes me think of like, oh my God, I'm com I sort of complain when it's only really me. And then I think about people at origin at the mills I'm like that's a much bigger how do you per, how do you get the same coffee out with all those restrictions here we have a mandatory mask uh thing as well which has been good uh in general people have been pretty respectful and we we also have a sign on the door like if you, if you don't have a mask you can't you can't come in you know i have family members i have a daughter um it's not about you it's about everybody right so so that's that's been an interesting thing to do. I'm almost I have an inspection next Friday, so hopefully that'll get through. But it was really tough because I literally couldn't do anything for this build out um, for a long time. Nobody was working, carpenters weren't working, electricians weren't working. Um, so we just you know thanks thanks to Snowdrift and Anne Rita, we just kept fulfilling orders um, online, which was great. And I think I think you mentioned in your question to the things that have shifted or changed and you know definitely what i've noticed is uh participation in social media like instagram was a i didn't really do that very much i think i think i took for granted 
the importance of connecting with people like for real not just in a business sense but like oh i'm a human i'm going through this stuff just as you are going through it that has totally changed the way that i approach business and it's almost like i'm, I'm bringing myself and my own personal philosophy to the business versus just looking at budgets and numbers and just doing that and going how can i flip this into this that that stuff is out the window for me at this point it's like how do i support uh customers wholesale partners people that are origin um co-workers colleagues how do it like it's it's totally i don't know it cemented this idea of humanity which is a tagline for machina but it it actually did it like i think way more about people way more than i and i thought about people a lot before but this this is really reshaped the way i think about my business that is as it as it connects to people so like Len was saying, it's uh, there's a silver lining to it. We'll get to that later. But yeah, I feel rough. you on that. I feel you on the kids homeschooling, man. Oh my gosh, <laughs> not even going <laughs> right now. <laughs> it's tough, man. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, it's an understatement. <laughs> so last week of school, I didn't think my boy was gonna make it out of seventh grade. I was like, oh my god, I'm like, what is happening here? I'm like, you're gonna have to do this again, and he's like, okay. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, 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 yeah. yeah. I hear you about the, about like the shift in business from wholesale to like retail and like for, for my business, it was kind of the same things. Like thank, you know, thanks so much for like that spike in like direct to consumer sales from the website because mm -hmm. the like added challenge of even if, if wholesale had stayed open, um, I don't know if you noticed this, but but for me, I noticed that like a lot of like importers started taking terms away and wanted immediate payment for everything. But yeah. a lot of wholesale accounts like to have, you know, a good 60 day terms, <laughs> 45 day terms. And it makes it really hard if you're, if you don't have like revenue coming from a cafe, it makes it really hard to bridge that gap financially. I just, I also think that's so short-sighted to have those, that, that policy, you know, it's so short, short-sighted to, to say, well, I, we can't offer terms. If anything, you should, you should be offering terms even more right now. Uh, Cause in the long, in the long term, you, <clears throat> excuse me, in the long term, you create loyalty, you create trust. It's a relationship. It's like a person to person. So I, I think, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, offering free shipping for whatever size, you know, wholesale account is a big deal. I, I just, I, I, I just think long term and I think about well where what kind of business do we want to be? Um yeah. I, I think right now in coffee, um this is my personal philosophy, and I, I think, but I, I think I've seen it played out, which is you sort of really know what kind of person you're dealing with when you witness how they act during a crisis. <laughs> like when like when everything's at its worst, just watch their behavior because if if they if they duck and run, they're like, whatever, you're on your own. That tells you everything you need to know from that moment on. If they sort of get in there and go, okay, this is we gotta now we gotta really stick together. And there's like this sort of calm that comes over you because you you know you can trust the person next to you. Um, you should probably stick with that person for a while, <laughs> you know. So it sort of weeds out, it's another silver lining, I guess. It weeds out the stuff that you're like, ooh, I don't I thought I had this down and I, I don't really wanna do that anymore, you know. I could just jump in real quick just to um, um, riff off of what Gabriel's saying. Um, one of the things we did with some of like, just like um, our wholesale accounts or restaurants that we want to be our wholesale accounts down the lines, maybe, uh, we were going around and just kind of just dropping off bags of coffee, be like, hey, I know your staff's still in here. You're, you know, your back of house is still in here trying to do takeout orders. We just want to leave you guys with some coffee to, you know, to let them keep working and and you know and have something you know that's complimentary you know and instead of just like sending like uh invoice uh payment reminders you know we were just like giving, you know just like you know it's a pound here and a pound there you know it does a lot to, to to build those kind of relationships and to show up for for um other businesses and in a time of crisis it really means a lot so i just thought you brought up a good point i wanted to kind of really? explore that I think to add to that too, like, you know, especially 
for those of us who have cafes and a roastery, like it's also just really nice to have that conversation of like, here's how we shifted and how we pivoted and like, how can we help you and your cafe like survive this? Um, I think has also been really nice. And I feel like, you know, um, I feel like even just beyond cafes, like with black and white, like we've just been like ping-ponging, like saving each other's butts like so many times. Um, we ran into with part of the spike in, in retail and some of the um, delays in shipping and, and freight. Um, you know, we got to a really scary point in our inventory of green coffee and um, Kyle just like drove over some bags for me, um, you know, and like we were able to return the favor later down the road, which is really nice. Uh, but yeah, I feel like since day one, it's just been like, you know, you got retail bags, sure. <laughs> I feel you on that limb. We literally ran out of our like branded retail bags from like the first month. We had bought five thousand, being like, "Oh yeah, this is gonna last yeah. us a long time." It's gonna time. be enough. It's gonna be enough. Sure. Yeah. yeah right. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> month one, and they were all out. Yeah, it's a, I guess that's a good and problem shipping to have, boxes right? as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 We've never really kept that many two pound or one pound, the smaller shipping boxes. We just don't, and all of a sudden it's like, I need hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, Beth, would you like to lead the, the next topic of conversation with the group? Oh, I think you're muted. Okay, got it, sorry. The next question is about racial justice and what happened after um, the murder of jo George Floyd. Um, so how did we deal with it? As businesses, was it, is it important to have an anti-racist policy for your business? And what strategies does your business incorporate? So I guess the question is, um, what happened right off? I mean, what are we? What are you doing? Or what is the business doing? Or what is the community asking us to do? Um, and Gabe, how about you? Sure. Um, well, you mentioned, you know, should we have anti-racist policies? Apparently, we need to, right? That's 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 sort of the shock, not shock. You know, um, it's it's like a bummer that you have to actually remind people not to be jerks and not and to be open-hearted individuals and um you know for for Makina it's always at least for myself and I think um like I said I think representation is super important because for Makina as a, as a Latino person uh that's always just been there for me in my life you know like being like the awareness of of being brown and also people you know random stuff reminded me that I'm brown too when I don't need to be reminded it's like I live this I don't need to be reminded that I'm Latino um, it brought up a little bit of a little bit of trauma for me in in a in a way um, just you know we're in a we're in an industry that literally the product is grown like 99% by people like people who are brown and black right and so that's just always been there in the consciousness um, so. I, my reaction to what happened obviously was, you know, it was horror. It was, it was that horror, but being like, of course this happened. Like, of course, you know, this, this not apathy, but more like, you know, we've understood that this has been a systemic issue forever. Um, and I think that the tough part has been, you know, how do you implement that into your business without, um, without bringing up, bringing up trauma for people? How do you do that without, you know, um, for Makina, it's simple because it's just li literally me um, and uh, Ant and Rita, who were really good friends. And I think that for Makina's going forward, it's 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 very simple. It's you you have you have to treat everyone with respect, dignity, integrity, and do not approach something as like, oh, we're colorblind. We're not a colorblind company. It's it's okay to say to somebody, I see you for being black. I see you for being brown. 
you're different than I am or whatever that is. And that's totally okay. I think the, the idea of colorblindness is not something that I prescribe to. I ascribe to, I think that it's important to acknowledge people's cultural backgrounds and how they view themselves and their family and wh where they're from or, you know, that's really important because if, if that just shapes a person and their experience in the world and that's okay to acknowledge that. Uh, in terms of policy, that's a hard one, right? Because I just, it's, to me, it's like, just don't be racist. <laughs> like just, you know, um, I, I don't really know, to be honest. I don't, I don't know how to even, um, how to formalize that, I guess is the best word. You know, how do you formalize that? One is, you know, how do you reprimand somebody? How do you create a safe space? I think the best way to do it is create, vocalize, creating a really safe space and expecting people and making it very clear that this thing, things that are not accept, acceptable in the work environment, um, but also create it. This is really important because I think we focus a lot on, um, on victimization. I think we focus a lot on that part, but it's, we have to focus the same amount of energy into the, you know, creating a safe enough space where people feel comfortable coming to you as, as the owner, the founder, the manager, when they're not feeling safe. Right, because I think a lot of people internalize it and never say anything, and it keeps going and going and going. And as 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 I'm not comfortable being anybody's boss, as Jen would tell you, I'm not. I hate it. <laughs> but if like you have to create, if you're in a position of, of of management, you have to create a space where somebody feels totally safe being vulnerable if they need to be, so that you can then address the issue. Um, and then you turn around and you and you address the person who's causing the harm or has or maybe not even causing harm, just is totally ignorant because we have to take into account where people come from. And if people are raised a certain way and they've never been exposed to something different, they don't even know how to manage something different. There's gotta be some compassion there too. You know, um, I, don't, I don't think that coming head on to somebody and just yelling at them is gonna do anything. Um, that's the easy thing to do, that's reactionary. So, I don't really have an answer in terms of, you know, what to do uh, besides formalize, like I just don't be a racist <laughs> and uh, accept people for who they are, have, be open to conversations, be open to growth. Uh, but certainly if something happens, you know, um, as, as Makina opens the production space and somehow I, I end up hiring somebody who's a racist, which I highly doubt would happen. <laughs> um, but if that were to happen or, or if an employee feels, you know, from, from a customer, uh, there's, there is no tolerance for that. Um, you know, there just isn't as as much as I want. I, I think tolerance doesn't go far enough. I think there has to be some sort of conversation that happens. Um, it's just creating a safe space, and I think making it very clear as a company and whatever you're doing in your branding and your marketing to be unafraid, to be very brave and very sort of gung ho about what your policies are, and to not and to not stop yourself short because you might offend someone or because it might be off-putting, screw that. Like if, if you don't like that we're anti-racist, don't buy our coffee, you know? <laughs> like I'm okay with that. Like I'm not gonna, I think that happens a lot. It's like, well, what, you know, be, being very careful with messaging, I think those, those days are over. I think it's okay to just be exactly who you wanna be, present yourself that way. And that'll encourage other people to be more open and to not feel so afraid to speak out. I don't know, it's a long and it's like a super long and winded answer. Sorry about that, but um, yeah. You know, you were talked a little bit about hiring and you mentioned like, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but Gabe hired me <laughs> as a roaster Best at Intelligence. Best ever did. Best interview and, ever too. That's another story. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah I've, I'm a ridiculous interviewer, I guess. But like, anyhow. Um, but that was a big deal because I was the first female roaster at Intelligentsia and you hired me. And so like you, were, I mean, you were technically a gatekeeper, you know, yeah. and, um, and right now in your business, you're going to be opening up this space and you're mm -hmm. going to be hiring. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So like, I, I, you know, like, what is your, like, are you going to, are you going to have like a written down strategy for that? Or are you thinking about it? I think, yeah, I've been thinking about it. Um, so you mean a strategy in terms of like hiring or, or strategy in terms of like um, policy or both? Oh, geez. I guess I thought about hiring, but um, yeah. Oh, no. I, well, the hiring policy is, is you know, um, for, for me personally, like my policy is, is 
hiring people that are different, <laughs> hiring people um, from like that are local to Coatesville, um, hiring people who are queer, hiring people who basically just haven't had a shot at, at being accepted as they are, because there's a difference, right, between <clears throat> accepting somebody as they are and trusting that if you if, if that that if you've built that trust, there'll be good employees because you've built that trust with them, that rapport versus hiring somebody that is different, but but sort of expecting them to assimilate to something that you feel is the right thing, that those are two different things. So um, my my uh, my goal is to hire locally people that, that work, you know, Philadelphia, Coatesville area that um, are, are considered people on the margins, I guess, you know, um, that's that's sort of my first facing forward facing policy. Um, after that, it's going to be interesting because I think the landscape has really changed in terms of what our responsibilities are as a business and as an employer. Um, I've never really dealt with that yet, <laughs> not in any real sense. So that's going to be a, a, you know, we'll see how it goes. I feel like all oh, this whole thing has created like a day by day mentality of like, all right, do the best you can, right? Do the best you can and keep moving forward one step at a time. Um, but for sure, like, I would love to have a staff of just people that have struggled a lot, people that haven't been given a chance because they've been judged by choices that they've made in the past or who they are as people. Um, I hope that I can provide a space uh, for people to feel whole, you know, and do something good for themselves and for the community. Okay. How about Lem? What are you doing? Uh, we have uh, a, a a no tolerance policy for any verbal or physical abuse, whether it's racial or sexual. Um, and I mean, being a, a young company, we haven't had any issue. And, and those policies apply to not just our staff, but also our customers. We have to hold those our customers responsible as well. Um, there hasn't been like an, a, a blatant issue of racism um, in, in our cafes, aside from a customer mispronouncing Ninga the wrong way. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, and, and I think with, with having that no tolerance policy, our staff feels comfortable uh, coming to us with with any issues whether it's with team members or or staff and and that's what we want we want to create that community um with with our staff with our with our uh, consumers our customers who come in every day and just make it a, a safe place for everyone um there's only been one situation where we had to talk to an employee where you know he had a crush on a barista and he was just being a little over flirtatious but uh, that's been the extent of it. There hasn't been any, any, any issue, but uh, the, the no tolerance policy for for any of that is uh, is, is is in place. And I mean, we have, I mean, our staff is mostly white, um, uh, half and half uh, female to male, and we have myself. We have uh, a barista. He's uh, Iranian American, and we have two Mexican Americans that work for us. So um, we're not as diverse as I would like us to be, but um, we're we're getting there. I think that's a discussion also is like what platforms are we using when we're out there seeking employees? You know what platform we've at our company we've had to like really look at. There are certain platforms you can use um, that you basically just get a white group that applies yeah. for the job. So what are some of the other ones out there? Yeah. Aureli. Yeah, I mean, when we first opened our doors in 2013 and we put our application out there, it was literally all white dudes who already worked at other cafes. We were like, okay. <laughs> So we, you know, that was just such, I mean, it wasn't surprising, um, but, you know, that made us like really put our applications out in places that we wanted to see represented. 
Um, and I think for us, it's always been important to um, hire people based on personality and character versus like their knowledge of coffee because we can teach that to them, you know? And it's like, coffee is a journey and it's such a beautiful journey and it's such a gift. So to, to have the right people for the right reasons rather than you have all this experience. I mean, granted, that's, that's great too. But I think for us, it's always just been like trying to build the best team. And I think, you know, since our very beginnings, it's always been about how do we use business as a way to undo these 500 year cycles. And that's within how you decide, how you hire, how you buy, you know? So it's also just like within policies, like who are you supporting? Like, who are you sourcing your coffee from? You know, I've been making it a huge effort to, you know, find importers who um, are representative of who we're buying our coffee from, like the origins, right? Um, and just like continuing to kind of on a daily basis, right? I think for us, it's the, that's why we named our Bushery Little Waves. It's, it's the little things that you do on a daily basis that amount to the big things. Um, and, you know, everything that Gabriel and Lem have said applies to what we're doing. And I think it's also just really important to understand, um, even just as like non-Black Latinos, like that we have our own internalized racism and colorism and biases. And it's just really important to have space and, and a safe environment to have those conversations with our team and understanding that like, you know, it's layered, it's so layered. Um, and being in uh, in neighborhoods and specifically the one that we're in right now, it's like a very black and brown neighborhood. Um, it's just really important to take a really good look at our, the way that we communicate and the way that we um, participate in community and you know, since day one, like I said in, in my introduction, it's like I've been around black, uh, I've been around brown and indigenous communities um, for most of my upbringing, and so like moving to Durham was um, a new experience, and just learning all about gentrification and learning about you know what does that mean for us, and just that's been such a heavy thing um, that I carry with me on a daily basis, especially. You know, like I feel like a lot of the times we get into this because we're really and not because we want to be bosses or um, managers. And so it's really learning um, how to be a good manager, like as you're trying to keep your business afloat as well. Um, so, needless to say, there's been a lot of learning. And I think the biggest thing is just like being open to that expansion. Um, as humans who are coming to work, who are like participating in the neighborhood. Um, and, and yeah, just like definitely a, a, no violence, a no violence policy in our business. Like we open, we, we encourage people to, we encourage people to want to participate in our space from all walks of life. Um, as long as, you know, there's respect in that. Um, and as soon as somebody's being violent there, out of here um but you know and but with even within that it's like who's deciding what's violent and what's not and who's also deciding what is safety and so that's to me that's such an important conversation to be having as a team who again is participating in black and brown neighborhoods and um we don't have all the answers um, and so it's just continuing to have these developments and and, and just having the openness for that expansion to understand that we, you know, are participating in capitalism, even if we're, we're, we're approaching it in a different way where people come first, it's still participating in capitalism and just trying to figure out like our next steps, right? And I think your question, Beth, was like what happened immediately after you saw um, what happened and, you know, this has been going on forever and I'm loving these conversations that we're hearing from the coffee industry, especially with Phyllis Johnson and Candace Madison, um, just about you know coffee in general and like it's it's history. And for us at Cocoa Cinnamon, like 
what's really important is the history and the culture of the, of the products that we serve and um, really paying attention to that fine line of like appropriation versus like elevating and amplifying the stories of um, the stories and the cultures of where these products come from. And, and for us, it's about highlighting that the beauty of all of that. And within that, it's like, how do our customers see and be are, are feeling represented in our spaces? You know, like the, the Lakewood location where I'm at right now, um, a lot of our signage is in Spanish. And to me, that's not just an indicator to our Latino community, but everyone beyond that. Um, and so it's just little things like that that we, try to implement and also just like, you know, like Gabriel was saying, it's also just really important in your hiring and also how you're creating leadership roles um, that it's a representation of your community. That like super speaks to me, Aureli, cause like, I um, like my, like my own racial identity is like my, I'm mixed race. My dad's, my dad's Mexican and my mom's white, but I am white, you know, I am a white passing Latina and I get tons of white privilege. So, I mean, nobody would even assume that I've, I'm of mixed race. So, um, but I think that what you were, what you were specifically talking about with like hiring and like the applications that you got, you know, it was, it's, it's really interesting to me when I was in a position to hire, like I had, it, it was so easy to hire women actually, because there's so many of them that are overlooked like all the time, you know? And if, when you look at like positions in management, you know, you see a lot of white men up there and which means that there's like an entire, population of people that never makes it into management and they're all fantastic and it's like you have these like you just have like your pick of litter of all-stars that are so easy to find and hire that that's how I feel about it and it's like it should be easier to hire people because there's so many people that are passed over and um and like I, I know that you in your mission statement talk about like the composition of your company yeah uh, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm Latina, so I see a lot of Latinos on our team, you know, um, my partner is, is white, he's, you know, Sicilian and everything off the boat from New York. <laughs> um, but, you know, for us, it's been, um, we don't have a lot of black men working for us. And, and that's, you know, something that we are mindful of and that we're paying attention to. And so it's like, you know, I don't walk in those shoes and I don't, I, I can't. And that's why I'd like, I'm always sending Lem messages. It's just like, oh, I'm just so proud of him. And I'm just so like, just so beautiful to see what he has created, whether he knows it or not. And I'm sure you know it at this point. I've told you so many times, but I'm just saying like, you know, he and my, my husband used to tell me this all the time, like you're representing this. And like, I hated it. I like, I hated the responsibility of it. And I hated like the limelight and I still do, but not not so much the, the fact that like, it's so important to be seen behind the bar and to be seen in, in, a, in a position of leadership too, you know, that like, like, yeah, like we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of growth to do and we have a lot of, um, unlearning and, and, and learning um, as a company. But I think that it's just, it's even just important to name it and it's important to, um, like if you see it, okay, well now what do we do about it? And, and what about like not having black men on our business, in our business, like what are things that we need to change to make it feel better for black men to thrive in our business? Yeah, that was, it was a, a, a famous, uh, competitive black barista came to me a couple years ago and said that he didn't want to be the diversity in the industry and I said you don't have a choice uh, um, you are that diversity and because you know me uh, I don't know how much influence I had on on your career uh, but you're here and we sponsored him in every way possible to compete this year. And he plays six in the world and then, or six in the US. And, and we hired him. We just recently hired Anthony 
uh, to come down. Uh, he's actually been working for us in New York, uh, you know, discreetly. But uh, but now we've officially hired him, and he's going to join the team here in North Carolina in August. Uh, so it's it's uh, it was a, a decision that we had to both Kyle and I make. Um, because I mean, we haven't been paying ourselves a lot of money, and we thought like 2020 was going to be that year that we could kind of like boost our salaries up a little bit. Uh, but with a great person like um, Anthony, for him and his family to move to North Carolina, we're like, well, it's not very important for us to, uh, as owners, to have these awesome salaries. Uh, what's important for us to have the right people. Um, at Black and White, and he's one of those those, those right people. And uh, this will be the kind of opening the door for other people of color to apply to Black and White. And we'll find a place for them. We'll find you know uh, money to hire them somehow. Um, and I think that's important for 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 us and, and any company really. So excited about that for y'all. Yeah. <laughs> And for North Carolina. <laughs> right? We're going to work together more now, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Nabil. Okay. Um, so, kind of like the genesis of well, from when I began Grand, um, we well, had a couple things. Uh, first of all, like working in the um, service industry in San Francisco for like 20 years, you would always see Basically, you had um, barely had any black people work in the service industry in San Francisco. It's the, um, black folks are very marginalized in this city. Um, but for brown people that were working in the service industry, they were back of house. If they were front of the house, they're going to be busters or barbacks. Um, so I actually I learned how to make coffee espresso as a barback at a very busy restaurant in San Francisco, and there was always that kind of like glass ceiling. You're always going to be support staff and. and when I worked at a lot of restaurants, I was stuck at like support staff and looking, I was working around people who were like, I could probably do their job much better than them. But still there was just, you know, you're, you're always, you're not going to be in a leadership position. Um, so that was kind of the genesis to start Grand Coffee was, was twofold. One, it was to empower myself uh, to be in a leadership position where I can hire and bring in other people of color um, to, to be like in like, so they don't have to, be tipped out by someone else. Like, you know, it's funny when the bartender calls the bar back, like, that's my bar back. I'm paying you. You do what you tell me rather than like it being like, no, that's my share of the tip pot of the tip pool. It's like, no, I'm paying you to do this. You know, so there was always that dynamic in, in the service industry. And, we want, and so I wanted to change that. So part of um, starting Grand, one thing was to take um, – uh, specialty coffee and bring it to a working class part of the neighborhood. Because if you know, if you're familiar with the Mission District in San Francisco, we're on Mission Street. One block over is Valencia Street, and they're two different worlds. With I mean, I'm talking like 200 feet apart from each other. You have two different worlds. So I wanted to bring like the stuff that's available on Valencia Street to more affluent white folks, bring it to Mission Street and make it available to black and brown people as well as white people because they're there too. And and so that was one part of the mission. And the other part of the mission is to hire staff, um, like a diverse staff. And basically most of my staff today, uh, pretty much it's all people of color. Um, I mean, it's a small staff with like six people. So it's not like, not like I'm hiring like 40, 50 people. Um, so, and, and so one of the things that was challenging was, if, okay, you want to do that, but how there because of the way the um service industry was kind of structured in San Francisco, like it's not like overtly racist, it's just like we're only gonna hire people with experience. Oh, you don't have experience, uh, you know, we can't hire you. So what as as um people in leadership positions, what we have to do, and I think this was mentioned already on the panel, is we have to be willing to to like you could teach coffee, you can't teach other things. You can't teach people, you know, how to be friendly or Maybe you can, but you know, there's there's certain things that we look for in people. But uh, pulling a shot of espresso or frothing milk shouldn't be one of them, because I mean that's our duty um, as as um, as a uh, uh, people in leadership positions is to teach those 
skills, number one. And then number two is, you know, as because we are roasters too, is to, is to bring people along into the production part too. It's just like, you know, like I know a lot of people that have worked in production facilities for, for different roasteries where they're like, oh yeah, well, well you're going to be a roaster. You're going to be a roaster. And meanwhile, they're just bagging coffee. They're bagging coffee and they're taping up boxes and they're, they're moving back. They're just, you know, they're, they're not being moved up. You know, it's like this carrot. They're going to dangle, um, like a lot of uh, management will dangle, um, in front of, the, um, like ambitious, uh, people of color to, to like, they think that they're finally going to get their chance and like they don't. So it's, it's really about, um, empowering, um, staff and, 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 and hiring people. I mean, like I'll, I hired a kid off the street that was like tagging my wall, you know, and like, you know, and it's, it's been, it's been a great journey to be working with him because he's, he's probably one of the best baristas I work with. He's a lot better than me now. Um, so that, and that's just the, 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 the thing you have to do. And, um, with respect to like, like, uh, dealing with racism, um, that's one thing that's that's really interesting, and I know I kind of like I'm not trying to be have reactionary politics when I say this, but I try to make our space as inhospitable inhospit as possible for racist people, you know, like and and it's and it's I don't think that's like like if you in order to walk into the coffee shop, we have a huge mural of Nelson Mandela on the outside, and it's been and I didn't wait, you know, wasn't there? It was it's been there since the beginning. It wasn't there like after? There we go. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it kind of like, it's, it's a subtle sign and it, it, it does a few things. First of all, like I see people walking by all day, the shop all day. When you see, when you see, uh, black folks walking by and they see that and they just kind of nod to themselves, it makes you feel really good. That it's like a, it's a positive affirmation of blackness. And, and that's something that, that, that's important. And it lets people know that they're welcome, you know, and, and, uh, in addition to that, the next step is like when people come to the shop, like we can't really operate on this, like customers always right kind of like situation because it's like the customer isn't always right. But at the same time, I don't want my staff to be rude. So how do you balance those things? So what we do at the shop is, is it's, it's very simple, a very simple tool. And it's, it's like, so I had to empower the staff to like, look, with anyone that walks in the shop, like, this is your space. This is your home. I want you to be a good host, but just make sure that the people walking in are going to be good guests. You know, it's, it's a very simple kind of paradigm to set up because I, you know, I had issues with, you know, there was what, one of the, the, the staff members who he's still at the shop. He's, he's grown a lot since he's been there, but he basically didn't know how to interact with white people because his whole life, the only white people he ever interacted with were either cops or like teachers that he's always getting in trouble with, you know? So he'd always like, Pull his hat low was kind of like afraid to like you know not afraid but you know wouldn't really make direct eye contact it just felt very uncomfortable so it was a process of like letting them know like hey just i want you to like just be comfortable here this is your space you know i understand like you might not have had a lot of interactions with 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 white people but just you know this is your house and they're coming into your house and um and you know so it was about building up people's confidence and 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 being able to own the, the, the dialogue and, and own, own the, um, the interactions. And, um, and I think people responded really well to it. Um, so that the shop that, you know, people, I guess if people were racist, they weeded themselves out because it was not a very comfortable place to be if you're like racist, you know? And I think that's, I mean, it's not really about culture wars because we're like, it's, we're affirming human rights here. We're it's if we're being pro we're proactively uh, saying that everybody counts. We're not denying people anything other than the right to feel comfortable to hate other people. You know, so it's like you don't like. There's that. I mean, you guys, some we got some folks from North Carolina here. There's that famous line from uh, from one of your uh, the favorite sons of North Carolina, Michael Jordan, where he was like, "Well, Republicans buy Nikes too." Well, you know, but the thing is, it's like, in coffee, like, I don't know, like, we don't really need your money, you know, there's there's plenty of enough money to go around, we don't need your money, and I'm not saying Republic, I'm just saying, 
people that might come into a space and mm -hmm. and and you, you know we've seen all the videos right of people acting out and, and being intolerant you know and and there's i think there's certain visual cues that we can put in place um uh that 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 can create a situation where where those people kind of weed themselves out and they could go somewhere else. I mean, if you look at it, look at Starbucks. Starbucks, they don't want any of their staff, even though there was a hashtag, let's talk about race, like what was that, like six, seven years ago when they were doing that? Now they like they don't want any of their staff to wear like any kind of BLM uh, paraphernalia. And I find that really interesting because they, they want to stay kind of like culturally neutral on these things. But I think the cafe historically, um, uh, has always been a place for um, for like rebel rousers and 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 for radical discourse to go down, and it's important that we maintain that. That's our tradition. Um, so that's you know that's it, it goes without saying. Yeah, I think you have to you have to be actively anti-racist. There's nothing there's nothing there's nothing bad about that. I don't, you know, there's nothing bad about that. You're literally saying we welcome you as you are. Um, and if someone has an issue with that, yeah, like you said, they can just go somewhere else. But I don't think we should shy away from stating we stand for humanity, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's not like you're not like uh, one side of the argument. Like there is no argument. At exactly. All. Like, exactly. There's no argument over like, who, you know, who should be allowed uh, uh, human rights. You know, this exactly. is this is a negotiation. It's, yeah. it's, it's very fundamental. <laughs> I think you bring up a really good point, Nabil, that I just thought of in terms of like, you know, all the work that we took to, to bring uh, a diverse group of people behind our bar. It's also really important that they see themselves in our customers as well, um, because that can be really, you know, harmful if, if it's not the case. And um, yeah, I mean, the coffee industry, like, predominantly, we have a very big white babies, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that for the most part in Durham, we're very lucky that all of our customers are very, like, uh, all about pro-humanity. <laughs> right. um, I don't think we've experienced too many uh, races, but I think that they just, like, see themselves out the door. Um, and honestly, like, that's been the case for some of our employees, too. Like, we had some people that, um, uh, haven't worked out because of our our way of doing things and um, and you know I, I feel like unfortunately that's always kind of been predominantly white men who just haven't succeeded or or not succeeded but just they just have somehow shown themselves out the door because it was just it felt too uncomfortable for them maybe to be led by women and women of color mm -hmm. um, but you know, more room for other people. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> I can just bring up one other thing is like, um, and again, I'm, I I love San Francisco. I love my city, but just because I could only use this as an example. So San Francisco, like you have some some bigger players that can afford. It kind of looks like tokenization to me, where we could be like, okay, we're gonna put like we're gonna grab like the the black barista. <laughs> And like have them on the cashier, so like that's the base that people interact with. It's like, oh wow, this place is cool. They have diversity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but you know, you hear stories and things come out like there's, you know, there's management doesn't really support uh, those people. But the next thing I, I we need to get to as people like that are running these shops is like, but the but America and the world's always seen like people of color serving white people. That's nothing new. So how do we get like the actual customer base to be more diverse rather because we are selling a luxury good, you know, yeah. and, At churros. you know, yeah. so, you know, so I think that, so that's the next challenge is like, okay, your staff is diverse, but if you just have a diverse staff serving a bunch of white people, we're yeah. still, we're still not there. We still have more work to do. So how do we get um, yeah. people of color to be like, you put them in the right. Well, you man, you mentioned it though. You meant you. I mean, you go to the neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's you know. I've been in coffee for twenty years, and that's always what happens. You you. 
and I get it. You make a business decision based on like, um, you know, based on density, population density, access to income, because you want to create revenue. You want people to buy your stuff, right? And so if you want people to buy your stuff, they need to have money, um, you know? And if, if you're thinking, well, if my ticket is, you know, on average, like $8, um, there's a specific section of the world that can afford that every day, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So the best way to do it really is cool. Have your flagship store, like make like the big bunny maker great. Cause that then hopefully will funnel into the other ones, but then maybe make other shops go into the neighborhoods that nobody wants to go into. Yeah. And, and I understand why, like there's reasons for that, but be very, very thoughtful. Just like Aurelia was saying, you know, be thoughtful about the importers that you work with, be thoughtful about the neighborhoods that, that you you're looking at. Look at the demographics, look at, the opportunity you you mentioned um you know the tokenization it's like well as as people of color owning businesses we have a responsibility to offer opportunities to the people that have never been offered those things before because if you're raised in a certain way if no one ever extends you that opportunity no one ever puts the trust in you no one ever says you can do this you're not going to get anywhere if you get keep getting passed over if no one takes that chance then that person doesn't get a chance to grow because it's systemic. It's not just one experience, it's many. It's a combination of many experiences, right? So the same way that you talked about, you know, being in the mission, I, I lived in, in, in the Bay Area for 16 years and I was the first ritual employee. So I'm very familiar with the neighborhood and the change that ritual actually brought um, to the neighborhood. And then the Castro, like, so I totally get what you're saying. And I think something that you're doing is exactly what we need more of, which is you put a shop, the neighborhood where there's you know working class folks where there's people of color um that don't have access to that because and if they walk like a block down it's only a block down but it's a different world and so they don't feel comfortable going to a fancy coffee shop so then there's this perception of a fancy coffee shop and what it what it represents you know so we have the responsibility to change that perception by making very specific choices that maybe are not only business driven they're they're social justice driven they are equality driven they are people driven um i think that's probably maybe it's idealistic but i feel like that that would make a huge ripple little waves <laughs> that'll make like a huge ripple if, if if all of us commit to like opening up a shop in a neighborhood that most people would be like uh you know um you don't know until you try it you don't know you know i'm thinking about west oakland you don't know you don't know what can happen you know, um, you have to just kind of be brave um, enough to do it um, so that you, <laughs> sorry, you create a ripple effect, you know. And that demographic thing is super important. Uh, having three shops in three different demographics, we can see the different types of people that come in. Uh, Wake Forest is mostly white people. Uh, yeah, we get some black students from the university, but uh, it's mostly white people. But we see the most diversity in downtown Raleigh because downtown Raleigh is super diverse. Um, and I mean, we partner with an amazing uh, chocolatier who's uh, really into being inclusive of all people. Um, and, and, and we see that uh, in, in that cafe. Um, so yeah, knowing your demographic and, and putting a shop wh where it matters. Uh, our, you know, our shops aren't aren't fancy at all. I mean, the fanciest thing in our shop is, is, is actually coffee. We just want our, our the cafe space itself to be uh, as comfortable, so we can um, you know, so people can feel like they can hang around and and drink this excellent cup of coffee and, and talk to some some people that might not look like them. You know, uh, yeah. and, and and downtown Raleigh is is, is what that is really about um, that's, yeah, we've, we've really achieved that there i feel like i like i fell in love with the coffee shops that were like from the 90s i'm old right so like i that old dirty shop where it's like everybody like has no speak money yourself, speak for yourself <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. and like you know i drank definitely like espresso milkshakes or something but like you know, like there's like the community board and there's like the books and, you know, and like that was, it was kind of like um, being in somebody's house, you know, like it was very comfortable. And I think that one thing like about moving to communities is that, you know, making sure that 
if you're going to go where the people are, then you have to be a part of the community too, you know? And I see a lot of, I think that it is dangerous to move into a community, but not actually be a part of that community or have a dialogue with that community. Um, and then just put your vision of what you want coffee to be inside of a community, you know? So if you do branch out, like, you know, you need to be considerate. You need to maybe listen more than you, you know, um, tell people what their experience should be. But, you know, it, it's a dialogue. And then you have the community that, like, loves you for being open, that is always there for you and the support. And uh, you have that re relationship and that trust that you build, right? Absolutely. You guys, we have been, we definitely went way over time. And I, like, thank you so much for staying in on this conversation. I, like, I just love that it turned into like you guys talking to each other and having a dialogue. Um, I loved that us white ladies were listening more than talking, which is fantastic, needs to happen more. Um, I guess as like, you know, as like uh, signing off with you guys, um, maybe each of you can speak to like, what you think the rest of 2020 is going to look like or you know like Lem you kind of mentioned a little bit about something exciting I mean I'm really excited about this ice cream I don't know how I'm going to get to North Carolina but <laughs> I'll just have to get my own ice cream and pretend or something <laughs> virtual experience with you guys but I would love to hear you know you can feel free to talk about what you're scared about or what you are excited about you know um I feel like this is, you guys can just kind of maybe start talking, whoever feels, whoever wants to go. <laughs> None of All right, you. I'll go. I'll go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, like I said before, we thought 2020 was going to be the year. I mean, this is year three. Um, we were, I mean, we, we built out two cafes in 2019. Uh, we were going to go after putting a cafe in the airport. Um, and we were going to build a training center in our new roastery because we had moved our roastery in 2019 to a bigger facility. So we had all these huge plans. And uh, then the pandemic hit. Uh, and yeah, all that came to a halt. But uh, we're, we're seeing things um, come alive again, um, maybe because people are taking the pandemic serious and they should be opening. But um, we are in a place where if things do get shut down again, um, we can navigate through that, I think, with ease, uh, as long as coffee is still deemed essential. Um, so, yeah, and we, we just hired Anthony to, to be our regional developer and do uh, more sales in, in North Carolina. Uh, on, the, on the racial tip, uh, we've seen so many uh, wholesale accounts come to us from, uh, I'm not going to name them, from a company that's been struggling with uh, racial issues within their company. Um, and uh, that's been great and it's also been awesome to see such a large company that has such an influence on the industry struggle with this whole race issue and that's going to be a great example of what not to do in your company especially as you're growing um, so we have a lot of work to do as an industry and i just hope that we can be a part of that in 2020 moving forward uh, it's very sad that um, you know, competition season has been uh, next this year, but it's also going to give us a chance to, um, you know, reach out to the farmers that we felt like, okay, your coffee was going to be competition coffee this year, but let's buy that coffee anyway and uh, market that coffee in a way that we can sell it in the U.S. Um, and then uh, also figure out how we're going to um, include social distancing into the competitions um, and you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's great. I think it's going to be a great year, uh, regardless of what's been happening. Um, I think we need to go through 
uh, a lot of growing pains. I feel like the U.S. has been going through a lot of growing pains, but now people are actually starting to pay attention to these pains and starting to do things about it. So I think the rest of 2020 is going to be a great year uh, for us as people, as citizens, and as specialty coffee. Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, I call one of you out if like. <laughs> I'm shy. Uh, yeah, I feel like, oh, wow. Yeah, there's been, I feel like the term for what's happening, what's been happening is an uprooting of sorts. And it's such a necessary one, um, even if it's like tough and difficult. Um, and so for me, like, I feel like my vision for 2020 hasn't shifted at all. Like, it's still the same because I feel like, you know, yeah, our path to getting there is different. Our landscape has shifted. Um, but for, for us, it's just allowing little waves to kind of step into its power and continue to, to put our, our mission out there and connect with people from wholesale to lamb. If you got an abundance, bring them our way. <laughs> um, you know, I just feel like, yeah, I feel like the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's been a new journey for us in, in, in little ways to like approach wholesale because Oh, we're not salespeople. <laughs> and, you know, it's just trying to figure out how to actually make human connections. And that that's what it's all about for us, right? It's like, it's not just about business. It's like, you know, our, our most fondest, like, connection has been Heirloom because they are a cafe in Raleigh who's owned by um, two folks who come from immigrant backgrounds. And they, you know, they've, approach their business from a cultural perspective too and it's just been really beautiful to like form that relationship and to the missions align so perfectly that i'm just like i need more of that you know i need i need more of that and everything else um and for us it's just like for like wholesale is what will bring in the revenue to create these careers that we've been seeking to create and you know we started our business since day one on the community for records. And I feel like it's a bit hard to make a picture down here. Oh wait for a second. yeah, I just I feel like twenty twenty is like the rest of the year. You know, we were thinking about competition this year too. Um, so it's a little sad, but that just gives us more time to prepare. Um, and it's all just about continuing to foster, <laughs> um, continuing to foster our people and, and, and nurture our people and figure out how to keep expanding as humans that are participating in that sort of thing. Um, just moving forward, I just, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I don't feel scared because I just feel like this uprooting is also that we can continue to set our roots in, in the right places. We're also bringing on paletas in, in one of our shops. So oh, nice. ah. yeah, we've been working on it. So yeah, that's, a, that's been another thing, right? It's just like trying to figure out, like understanding that this is, this is a long, a long marathon. And this isn't going to be like, I don't, I don't foresee us opening our shops up anytime soon. So trying to think beyond just our, our coffee and, you know, for us, it's the experience that, that people come here for. And so it's how do we package that up and how do we create things and that are true to us um, within Cocoa Cinnamon, the name itself just is a big umbrella for opportunities. Um, so yeah, we're looking at paletas. We started doing spicy aguas, um, you know, um, kind of getting back to our roots. When we first started, we were specifically uh, working with chocolate. Um, uh, we're not trying to become chocolatiers, but we've been thinking about like 
um, cacao. Um, and that's such an ancestral um, product that it's just, it's just magic to work with it. Um, but yeah, just thinking about things that we can be adding to our menu that um, are expanding our opportunities for, for growth. Uh, I'll jump in. Oh, can I jump in? And I just want to say, this is hoping, part of me hopes that I can fast forward to uh, past the pandemic, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I'm sure we all do. Um, but, you know, this, for real, this is like a, just a time to kind of like just dig in our roots and and, um, and really kind of evaluate what, what's important and um and uh just just kind of weather the storm and, and you know try to get through this uh um with as little damage as possible but i think it's we uh, you know if, if we manage things right we can really come out of it stronger than uh than before because we you know it's just like just basic business things of like just don't assume things are always gonna continue to go up 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 you know we have to we have to be able to uh, save for a rainy day and kind of um, uh, recession-proof our businesses and be be nimble. I think we all demonstrated that at the beginning part of the uh, this this talk, this panel today. We all talked about things that we did and how we were able to pivot. So you know, we're just we're all resilient human beings, and um, it, it's just nice to uh, to see other people going through it too. Um, but uh. Yeah, this year has been, um, hopefully 2021 has a lot of new changes, right? <laughs> and we could just get through the next six months with as little uh, damage as possible. Um, so, yeah, I'm just thankful to to be able to be a part of this. So thanks, you guys, for uh, for sharing this knowledge with me. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess it's interesting that maybe Luke, you said you know resiliency because man, if anybody's built for this stuff, <laughs> it's a uh, it's women and people of color <laughs> and people who have not had power or privilege. It's like we've been doing this stuff forever. <laughs> we've been yep. sort of mode anyway in a lot of ways, survival mode, you know, because we've had to we've had to do things differently forever to to get to where we need to be. Uh, 2020 sucked. It sucks so far. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty intense. I mean, it's like, you know, homeschool. <laughs> That's like, it's like right there to the pandemic, you know? <laughs> like, ooh, wow, patience. What is that? It's just a fleeting thing. <laughs> um, uh, but there is a silver lining because like I said before, I've, I've never experienced, and you know, I, I work for another, for, I have another job um so i i've i've never seen more of a, a need i guess like a forced need to just be real to just get real let's just like stop the bs let's just talk to each other like we really understand where we're coming from Stru you know, let's talk about the struggles let's talk about the stuff that really is terrible and and why haven't we done anything to change it because we haven't had to we became complacent right and the pandemic has shown us it's like whoa, whoa, whoa. it's like mother nature it's like mother tierra is like okay you know what you guys like just keep messing up. So I'm just gonna do this for you. <laughs> let, let me just throw all this stuff out there so that maybe maybe it shakes you to the core, like the uprooting, right? And we think about what's really, really, really important. Um, so in a way there there is a positivity to it um, because in, in, in this moment where we're being asked to social distance, to wear masks, to almost, to almost like, um, I don't know, to it's weird. It's like a flip, you know. There's this notion that we're we're so connected via social media, but we're actually not. We've been disconnected, you know. And in the process of pointing out how we need to keep our distance, it's actually forced us to really reevaluate our relationships to each other and how we can best be there for one another. That's my experience, anyway. Um, and so, in terms of business, I think I think there is there is a positive that's coming out of this. I think we're having the conversations that I think a lot of us have always had within our own circles about inclusivity, um, about women in coffee, gender equity, about trans people, about queer people, about brown people. Like all that stuff is like all on the surface now. We can't get away from it. We got to talk about it. 
Um, so it's 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 sort of cracked open a, an amazing opportunity. We just I hope we don't mess it up. <laughs> you know, I hope we we can rise to the moment and 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 use our experiences and our positions um, in the world and our businesses to really really create something even better or what we've always wanted to do. Because now it's in the it's in like the social awareness and consciousness now. It's not just in our own lives and our families. It's like out there now. It's like oh, this is stuff we've been talking about with our own friends for like 20 years. <laughs> and now it's like this thing that people are noticing. And thank you for the you know the white allies. Thank you because you know I think that we just need each other. It's like a like no greater message is like oh yeah we're in this s h i t together. <laughs> And there's nothing we can do about it. So let's uh, let's collectively keep working. Like you said, Jen, it's an everyday active thing you have to do. Not just a, a, a posting a message on Instagram and then just being like, oh, I did my part. You know, it's like like we have to actively do this every single day and wake up and go, how can I be of service? How can I help? You know, um, there's there has been a, a moment in my life and I'm. 42, because Jen and I are two days apart. <laughs> I'm 42, and I, it's like this is the most intense I've ever felt um, in my whole life. Of like, this is the moment where you have to step up and do stuff, and that means using our business for good, you know. So thank you, thank you for for sharing your experiences, because I, I, it's just it's so nice to find solidarity out there. Yeah, it's like there's two pandemics. It's like this environmental pandemic, there's this human pandemic, but like you said, it's on the surface now. We can't ignore it. And I think we're going to come out of this with 2020 vision in 2020. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> that was a good one. I like that. Right there. You know, it's interesting. Like, I mean, all these, all these thoughts, I mean, like, you know, entrepreneurship, creativity like kind of go hand in hand you know what I mean like you are all folks that are like even if something is an obstacle in front of you you're going to be like all right how am I going to get this obstacle out of my way and get to where I'm going and I think that you have to like have that spirit and so you know I think that that's one of the parts where you can be like optimistic you know like I know how I feel about my own personal company and what I'm trying to accomplish I mean like there's like I don't even know, <laughs> but, or, but, you know, going to something like, you know, I feel like I have two gens. I got the gen with mother tongue coffee. Well, I got three gens. I got Jen that's fully collective. And then I got, well, then I got Jen, the mom doing, you know, home. Oh my God. Homeschool. I, I'm awful at it. I suck. I mean, I'm surprised that he have surprised me, Pat, you know, I need school to come back. And then, and then there's also like Jen that does, um, stuff like with the coffee roasters guild right and it was interesting because you know like i knew what jen mother tongue was going to do because i'm in control of that you know i knew like who i wanted to reach out with i knew who i wanted to donate money to i knew who i knew who i could say like well i have this available i can bring people in and help you know give access to whatever i might have access to and be able to offer that but um like Jen, the Coffee Roasters Guild, like it's a it's a volunteer organization, you know, and so and it was really interesting for even through the pandemic and everything else coming up with a statement and the conversations that we had as an international group. It was um, like we didn't come out with a statement very fast because we had to have a lot of conversations, you know, it wasn't something that we could just like gloss over and push real quick, even though there was an urgency to, to read something or to see a statement, but we had too much, we had to do actually real work to get there. And, um, and it's interesting to think of how, you know, with a group that is so focused on in-person events, you know, like it's a lot like competition, kind of like how Lem was saying, like, and to not be able to have access to in-person events, like how do we recreate ourselves and how do we offer um, value to our membership with networking and knowledge? And so um, I, I think that it's having conversations with people like you guys. So um, I thank you for joining on this call. I really do. And um, like, I, I just want to see more conversations like that. And my biggest fear 
in 2020 is that this will be just a blip and I want it to be, I want it to be long-term, you know, and I want everybody to keep pushing, keep having this conversation. So yeah. Thank you guys. I totally agree. Agreed. Thank you. I, I feel the same way. I feel like the realness of this is, has a lot of impact. And if we can keep that going, real conversations, real listening. And I really appreciate all y'all today because this has just given me so much to think about, so much to talk about with our group as well as the SEA US chapter. It's been incredible. Thank you. Thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. appreciate it. I was so psyched about this panel. <laughs> Now go out and buy coffee from all these people. <laughs> I'm sure there's links somewhere. Okay. All right. So we're signing off. I don't actually know how to do this. So all right. Okay. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 Best wishes. Until next time. I don't know. Isn't they going to come back and talk to us now? <laughs> Or did we just hang up? I don't know.